real pleasure for me to introduce Harry Green to you tonight. I've known Harry since we were both uh, graduate students a long time, just after the Civil War. <laughs> and, um, I, I took Harry out to dinner last night, and I found out a whole lot of interesting things about him that he doesn't want me to tell you. Like when he was an undergraduate and lived over a funeral home and was an ambulance driver and delivered babies and um, his very distinguished undergraduate university career, which, wow, he went to a lot of different places. <laughs> That's right. Undergraduate. But one thing that Harry always had was an interest in herpetology and in snakes in particular, and he actually published two scientific papers when he was still in high school, and then four papers as an undergraduate, and he's continued to publish papers and books ever since, including a very popular book on snakes, which was uh, given the Penn Literary, Literary Award and a New York Times 100 notable books of the year it was published. It's still available, and if you Google it or go to Amazon, it's highly recommended. It's a beautiful book. Harry's also um, a very accomplished teacher and has won numerous awards from undergraduate teaching uh, or for undergraduate teaching at both Berkeley and at Cornell University, where he currently is. He teaches intro bio for non-science majors at Cornell, and I've been talking to him about how he keeps people's attention, and it's really interesting. I'm gonna use some of his techniques in the course I teach next term, and I hope we don't make the newspapers. He also uh, teaches a course in herpetology and a graduate field ecology course, and is working on a book, which is gonna be really interesting, called Tracks and Shadows. It's gonna be a field biology book, as uh, field biology is art. So tonight, Harry's going to talk about natural history museums, aesthetics, and conservation. So please welcome Professor Harry Green. Thanks, Bill. So sounds okay? My sound's fine. I have wires all over me right now. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me. I am going to talk to you about natural history museums, aesthetics, and conservation. And here's where we're going to, where we're going to go in the next few minutes. I'm going to next several minutes. I'm going, to, I'm going to first just talk just a little bit about the meaning of these words, museums and specimens, so we can sort of ground what I'm going to talk about in the context of this whole uh, museum theme year here at the University of Michigan. Then I'm going to pose the question, why should we care about nature? This is a question I'm acutely aware of since I mostly work with venomous snakes and not everybody cares about venomous snakes. So it's been something I've thought about my whole research and teaching career, how to get people to care more about unpopular organisms. I'm going to talk about a distinction that the famous uh, renowned German philosopher Immanuel Kant made between beauty and sublime. And then I'm going to combine that with Darwin's insight about evolution as heritage. We usually think of Darwin in terms of natural selection, but I actually think his other sort of main insight, the idea that life has a history and that there's been descent with modification is perhaps even more profound. And so I'm going to talk about combining Kant's insights about aesthetics with Darwin's insights about descent with modification. I'm going to illustrate my points, first of all, with a, a somewhat extended conversation with you about frogs. And I'm going to end by talking about my favorite organism, snakes. So that's where we're going in the next 45 minutes or so. All right. First of all, let's think about this question of what is a museum. And so I went to the internet, of course, and here's a definition from the International Council of Museums, an institution in the service of society and its development open to the public, which acquires, conserves, researches, communicates, and exhibits the tangible and intangible heritage of humanity and its environment for the purpose of education, study, and enjoyment. That has to have been written by a committee. There's just, I, I just sat in a meeting the other day in which we did something like this, and people kept adding words. I mean, I guess we know what a museum is now. But that is what museums encompass. Um, they usually encompass some kind of objects. My prediction is that's going to become a somewhat fuzzier definition in the coming century because of the advent of digital technology, that we're going to see a less clear distinction between a specimen or an artifact or an object of art and all the ancillary information that goes with it. I think we're going to see many new unexpected uses of museum artifacts, specimens, even digital images and so forth. And actually, I'm going to start off with an example that shows you a somewhat unconventional use of museum specimens in zoology. But however that is the case, I'm also going to argue that 
it's always going to be the a truism that organisms at the, are at the core of biology. So, you know, we've just seen 50 years of tremendous technological advances in biology, the advent of molecular biology, the advent of sequencing. I mean, it's just, it's progressing at an amazing pace. And for a while, I at least saw these as sort of antithetical forces in biology, molecular biology technology on the one hand, my kind of biology on the other. I, I think that that conflict is over. It's so clear now that all these technologies bring us the potential to really finally answer the questions that were being posed by Darwin and Wallace over 150, well, some 200 years ago. And the questions are all are gonna come from organismal biology. It's, it's organisms that are the integrative locus of biology. It's organisms where all the real promise of this fantastic technology is gonna play out over the next century. Okay. Let me just give you an example of a little bit of unconventional museum specimen use. This is the kind of thing I do a lot in museums, and that's to explore the natural history of organisms, their ecology and behavior and so forth. I just completed a study of one of the commonest snakes in Western North America, one of, the, one of the most widely kept pet snakes in the world, and a species for which there is no detailed study of its natural diet in the literature. If you wanted to go out and study snake feeding in the wild, you, you wouldn't get tenure. I mean. Snakes probably average five, six, eight, ten meals a year in the field. Your chances of seeing a snake eat that meal are very, very small. So we relied on, on other sources of information to study the diet of the California king snake in detail. What you can see up here is the number of uh, acronyms for museums on the West Coast, California Academy of Science, Museum of Urban Zoology, and so forth. The number of specimens we examined. So we looked at a grand total of uh, more than 2,500 specimens. On the average, about 10 to 15% of the snakes we look in the stomachs have actually got a food item. So we get the food item out, we measure it, we take all the data on the specimens. You can see down at the bottom that we got a grand total of 374 California king snakes for which we had some natural diet information, a total of 423 actual prey items from these king snakes. And if you look at where we got our information about Mm, a little more than 50% of all that information came from looking at museum specimens, like the one shown in the jar there. Now we can do a lot of things with that, and I don't want to spend the evening telling you about the feeding ecology of California king snakes, but I'll just show you two of the kinds of details we can do with this information with museum specimens. Here's what they actually eat in nature. So it turns out the California king snake's a real feeding generalist. It eats about 11% birds, 3% lizard and snake eggs, very rarely amphibians, about 30% rodents, 25% lizards, some unidentified reptiles. And you know why it's called the, the king snake? Because it eats other snakes, and in particular, it eats venomous snakes. In fact, it's got specific biochemical adaptations for feeding on rattlesnakes. It's immune to their venom. Now, when you hear something that's especially adapted for some particular task, you might think that task is really important in its lifestyle. You might even think that rattlesnakes would be a common prey item for California king snakes, given that they have this indisputable adaptation for feeding on them. Well, we found about 28% of the overall diet was snakes, but only about 22% of those snakes were rattlesnakes. That is about 6% of the overall diet of the species in nature is a prey type for which it has very specific adaptive modifications. It's, it's sort of puzzling that would have this adaptation for something that's actually not very important to it in the sense of prey frequency. I'll show you just one more thing we could learn. We did many analyses using a data set so large, but we, could, we had enough data that we could actually look at seasonal variation in different prey types. So if you look at these color-coded things here, uh, there's one peak where mammals become very important in May. That's probably when there are lots of nestling California voles and other small rodents out there in the landscape. So mammals are only important in the diet in one small part of the year, but they're very important in that part of the year. You can see a couple of, uh, you can see three peaks in the orange line. So what happens with this snake diet? It's as if they eat snakes when nothing else is available, okay? Snakes are almost like they're, 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 they're potatoes. You know, they, they sort of go back to snakes when birds aren't there, when lizards aren't there, when, when mammals aren't there, okay? But this is just a small part of what you can do using museum specimens in an unconventional way. I, however, want to talk about a somewhat broader problem which is, why do all this? I mean, why should anybody care about us doing this stuff? Or why should I, as a biologist, uh, or to put it a little differently, what might the things I do as a biologist who works in a museum, how, how might that information apply to broad, broader problems in society, and especially to the problem of biodiversity loss? So that's, that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight. And let me pose it to you by showing you one of the most beautiful animals I've ever seen in my life. 
Okay? I took this picture about five years ago in central Brazil of a large pit viper called an Uru 2. It's about three and a half feet long. She probably weighed about two pounds. Uh, stunning black and silver white color pattern. When you go around a, a kern in this, turn in this red dirt road in the Sahados, these tropical savannas, and there's this big, beautiful pit viper crawling across the road. You stop the car, get one picture off. She snaps into a defensive coil. You get closer and look at her more closely, take some more pictures and let her go on her way. I mean, I, I was stunned. I will never forget this the rest of my life. It's one of the most beautiful animals I've ever seen in the field. And here's what Charles Darwin said about it. The expression on the snake's face was hideous and fierce. I do not think I ever saw anything more ugly. <laughs> so, clearly Charles had a lot to, long way to go in terms of appreciating snakes. And, and, and that's the question I want to ask. Does, does something have to be beautiful in any kind of conventional or traditional or widespread sense for it to have aesthetic value, for us to care about it, to appreciate it? This is another quote. Uh, I like this quote very much. I think it summarizes the interactions between being a scientist, being a teacher, and being part of a larger society that's trying to come to grips with a biodiversity crisis. This comment was made in the mid-70s at an IUCN meeting by a Senegalese conservationist named Baba Dioum. In the end, we'll only conserve what we love, love what we understand, and understand what we are taught. And I don't think that the only way you learn things is by sitting in a chair and having somebody lecture to you, but I do think that the things you learn place sort of the rest of your life and the way you feel about things in life in a broader context. I think that the things we teach, the things that we find out as scientists, teach as teachers and learn as students affect the way we feel about things. And that's what I want to explore in the talk tonight. Why does this matter? Well, I think it matters because we're not even close to admitting how bad the biodiversity crisis already is. Uh, there's a fair number of people in this room that are close to my age at least, and I'll bet you agree that when we were little kids it was inconceivable that the tiger would go extinct or the polar bear would go extinct. And yet it's fairly likely the tiger and the polar bear will go extinct. I mean, I'm sorry to say, but it really is quite likely that it's already too late for the polar bear and the tiger. Okay? It's a very serious scene. I'm going to illustrate it here with an amphibian because I'm a herpetologist. This is called the golden toad, and it used to be abundant in the Monte Verde Cloud Forest Preserve in Costa Rica. When Jay Savage, a professor and herpetologist at the University of Southern California, walked into the Monte Verde Cloud Forest Preserve in the early 1960s and saw these toads, because he had seen toads all over the world and because there was no known toad that was scarlet orange as a male, he thought his graduate students were playing a trick on him. He toyed with the idea that his graduate students may have actually painted the male toads. To, to trick him. And grad students do do things like that <laughs> occasionally. Uh, things have been done to me almost that, that harsh. But they, they weren't hoax. It was a dramatic new species of toad. It was abundant. It was named Bufo Paraglinis in a paper in 1965. By 1990, it was extinct. It had disappeared from the earth. And it didn't go extinct as a result of human persecution. It didn't go extinct because of a leather trade. It did not go extinct because of the pet trade or over collecting. It did not go extinct because people eat it. It went extinct without us even realizing it until after it was over. It went extinct almost certainly because of subtle changes in the cloud forest climate on the top of the ridge where it occurred, its only home in the world. Okay? It happened without us even knowing it. I think it's a sort of a stunning and, and a very thought-provoking example of the crisis we faced. What to do about this? Well, it, it sort of matters whether it matters. I mean, whether or not, just how much we're going to do about this is going to depend on whether people care or not. And I think education is really huge in that. I think we're, we're all teachers. I think a mechanic can be a teacher. I think you can be a teacher over your backyard fence talking to your neighbor. But again, how does it matter? How does it matter to teach people about, about animals? And, and that's what I want to talk about. Those kids on uh, your left are looking at that Baba Dion quote at the Bronx Zoo. On the right, you see a scene from the last natural history of the vertebrates field trip I led at University of California, Berkeley. The man who's got his head tilted and looking at his hands named Javier Rodriguez, and he was my last PhD student there. And he was doing his PhD dissertation on the feeding ecology of gopher snakes. And on this class field trip, we just caught a hatchling gopher snake, and Javier has just gently caused it to regurgitate its most recent meal, which is a half-digested California vole nestling. Okay? So Javier looks very serious in this picture. He's, he's got one more data point, and he's thinking, well, I've got to get it on my Pasola scales and weigh it, and I've got to measure it. I've got to write down that it was swallowed head first. I've got to measure the little gopher snake before we let it go, so on and so forth. 
What I think is really interesting is the look on the woman with the glasses. That, her name is Saren Kim, and she's actually a doctor now. She's about two feet from a half-digested, recently vomited California vole, and she could not be happier. Okay? Look at the look on her face. Okay? She's been prepped for that moment. Okay? She's learned about how snakes eat. She knows about how the streptostylic quadrate and the liberated mandibles and so forth work on a snake's head, and she's just seen a little vignette in natural history, and she couldn't be happier. Okay? So, why is that true? Well, let's talk about Immanuel Kant for just a minute. And I want to tell you that I am not a philosopher. When I first read this Keister paper, which is where I read about this distinction between beauty and sublime and its application to biodiversity, I thought maybe if I was going to talk about this, I should read some Kant. So I actually checked out a translation of Critique of Judgment, and I got about two sentences into it. It's, it's just not for me. I, I can't do it. I really am a, a down-in-the-trenches field biologist, and so what I'm going to say about Kant is really based on this paper by Ross Keister. I did publish a subsequent um, discussion of some aspects of this, and if you're interested in this overall application of this notion of beauty and sublime to biodiversity, and you'd like to read these papers, if you just send me an email at Cornell, I'll send you PDFs of the two papers. Um, here's what Kant said. The beautiful concerns the form of the object, which consists in the objects being bounded. That's, that's a translation, of course. But what he means is, beauty is a property of an individual object. It's basically perceived without context. Sublime, on the other hand, is formless and unbounded, strikes the imagination in a particularly powerful way. That is, it depends on information, it depends on context. And I want to illustrate that for you with three inanimate objects before we talk about applying this distinction to, to biodiversity. These three objects happen to be perhaps my three most precious possessions. I think they're all either neutral to you or in the case of the Winchester, maybe you find it a really, really ugly uh, object. But let me tell you just a little bit about each of them. The middle object is a rolling pin that my grandfather carved out of a single block of white oak in East Texas in 1921 as the only Christmas present for his new bride, my mother. Okay, they were dirt poor East Texas farmers and that was her Christmas present. And my grandfather made it with his pocket knife and I own it now. The blue book is called Bombers Across. It was written by a B-24 pilot in uh, World War II. My dad was a B-24 navigator, a 24-year-old uh, Air Corps navigator, and he sent that book with his 24-year-old penciled annotations in the margins back to his parents in Endicott, New York, so they would know what he was going through as a crew member on a B-24 over Europe. And I found this book after my father died. So imagine being able to read your father's handwritten 24-year-old thoughts about tragedy and fear and war and so forth when you yourself are an aging veteran and, and uh, you never ask your dad about any of these things. The Winchester is a little, uh, maybe a little trickier. It's certainly the most un-PC gift a Berkeley professor ever received from his graduate students. I'm quite sure of that. Uh, but I grew up in a rural... Uh, Western environment where guns were not uh, objects of evil in cities, killing people in drive-by sittings, but were uh, drive-by shootings, but were tools that you were taught to use properly and safely by your grandfather and your uncle and so forth. And my graduate students knew that I wanted an old Model 94 Winchester, and one day I found a note in my mailbox in Berkeley that said, one antique Model 94 carbine you find it will pay for it. So they gave it to me. So now maybe you can see those three objects in a somewhat different aesthetic light. Maybe you can see why, although you might not care about them, maybe you can see why I can, right? So what we want to we do is think about beauty as, proper, as, a, as something characterizing individual organisms and sublime aesthetics, what I'll call biologically sublime aesthetics, transcending individuals in terms of our aesthetic appreciation. It's worth remembering that Darwin himself was uh, quite poetic at times and certainly had an aesthetic sensibility about him. These, the famous quote from the last part of the Origin of Species, there's grandeur in this view of life, that whilst this planet has gone circling on according to the law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have evolved. Descent with modification, this is this brilliant phrase of Darwin's, at least I think it's brilliant. It's one of these things where there's so much in just three words, okay? Because descent means you have ancestry, you have descendants, you have life through time. Modification means that as that life goes through time, parents having offspring and so forth, you're getting diversification, okay? So descent with modification is a three-word description of 
the uh, heritage of life's diversification. So it, it brings up thoughts like ancestry, pedigree, lineage, legacy, inheritance, sublime notions of group characteristics. You could even think of sublime notions of group pride. I'll also talk about natural history a little bit, by which I mean in, in the context of tonight's talk, the lives of organisms in nature. Organisms that are out there subject to the contingencies of making a living, finding food, avoiding being eaten, finding mates, and so forth. So, one more thing. It turns out Kant actually made a couple of distinctions within his notion of sublime. He talked about mathematically sublime applying to magnitude, immensity, and sheer numbers. And I'll show you an example of what I think is biological mathematical sublimity. He talked about violent storms, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions as examples of dynamically sublime experience. So again, what we're going to do is take Darwin and Kant together, evolution and natural history, and think about biologically sublime aesthetics. I want to make clear again that I know these are complicated concepts. I know that there's a vast literature on the meaning of words like beauty and sublime. Uh, here's just a couple of examples from some well-known uh, dictionaries. I also know that there are attempts to understand the neurobiology of aesthetics, and I'm not an expert on those things, and I'm not going to try to go there tonight. I really am going to try to stick to what is it we know about organisms, how do we find that out, and what happens to us in terms of our aesthetics and valuation of organisms when, when we learn new things about them. I do want to say one more thing about descent with modification. I teach introductory biology to about 450 freshman business majors. Okay, about 12% of whom we learn from surveys are usually uh, literal creationists. So one thing I have to do when I start to teach them about biodiversity is get them to think about this notion of genealogy of descent with modification. And I do this by first bringing up the concept of a family tree. I mean, I think everybody has this notion of we have a genealogy. You can pay money now and get a family tree for yourself, right? So here's a family tree, a sort of somewhat idealized hypothetical family tree that on the left-hand side starts with me and my brother. My last name is spelled with an E on the end because we're descended from a Revolutionary War general named Nathaniel Green, okay? And beyond that, from English colonists. So if you trace my family tree back far enough, and I suppose you can do this now, uh, you'll go back to England sometime in the 14, 15, 1600, something like that. I have a good friend, Gabriela Parra, at the University Nacional Autónoma de México, who also could trace her history back, but it won't go back to Nathaniel Green, will it? It's going to go back to Cortez and Hernández and the other Spanish explorers and colonizers of the New World. So Gabriela and I did not have a common ancestor that was in the New World. So I asked my students that. Do you see how you could go back from me through descent to, to, to some ancestors of Harry and Will and so forth in England. Oh, sure. Do you see how Gabriela and Gerardo and so forth have an ancestry that goes back to Spain? Oh, sure. Do you think that Harry and Gabriela shared a common ancestor? Then there's a little pause. But of course, obviously, Harry and Gabriela shared a common ancestor, right? Where do you think that common ancestor was? Well, they think about it for a little while. And they decide it probably was Western Europe, okay? How long ago was it? Well. I don't know either, but it must have been more than five or six hundred years ago, right? Probably a lot more than five or six hundred years ago. So we get them used to this notion. I point out that with family trees, the convention is that the present's on the bottom and the past is on the top. The names of the sort of living taxa, so to speak, the living kinds of organisms are names of people, and they go back through family lineages in time. And then I just flip to a phylogeny, an evolutionary tree of vertebrates and their closest relatives. And just as is the case with people, these trees reflect the special heritage of lineages. Now we have the present at the top and the past at the bottom. We have kinds of organisms as the branch tips and their ancestors as the nodes where the branches meet. And we can see that each lineage, this is sort of a, a, a hierarchy of relationships, and we can see that lineages reflect the presence of four legs presence of a vertebral column, the presence of a mouth, and so forth. These are all lineage characteristics. So that's a, one of the two frameworks, descent with modification, in which we want to think about aesthetics of living organisms. Let's look at some frogs now. I think that if you went to Kmart, this is always my idea of how to sort of sample the American public is, in terms of attitudes is go to Kmart and ask 100 Kmart shoppers. And I think if you ask 100 Kmart shoppers how many kinds of frogs they are, there are, they would probably first say three. 
if they really thought about it. So there's water frogs, tree frogs, and toads. And then maybe there's different kinds of frogs on different continents. So maybe there's 20 or 30 kinds of frogs, toads and tree frogs in the world. In fact, the number is growing almost weekly, but there are now more than 5,570 described species of frogs. And we know a fair about, bit about them and about their relationships. So on the left here you can see a, a classification of all frogs. Frogs are placed in a group called the anura, which means no tail. It turns out that all frogs belong to one of two basal lineages that diverged in the Jurassic. One's called the Lyopelmatidae, one's called the Lilago batrachia, which means the singing frogs, and so on and so forth. I just want you to realize that we know a lot about the relationships among these 5,570 species of frogs. And as you can see, they're pretty colorful. Maybe you can also see that I'm arachnophobic. Okay. Uh, it turns out, though, there's some really cool things that characterize all frogs. Essentially, frogs as a group are jumping machines. The origin of frogs associated, was associated with a major reorganization of the bones and muscles of the back half of the body. When you look at a frog sitting still, it looks like there's a hump in the middle of its back. That's not actually the middle of its back. That's the end of its back, okay? That's the end of its back and the top of its pelvis. And the pelvis of a frog, the ilia, which are one of the three pairs of bones in the pelvis. The ilia, which for us are these kind of broad, bumpy things that you can feel right here. In a frog, they're like long poles that go forward and articulate a joint on each side with a process that comes out from the last vertebrae. Okay, and so that's a movable joint. A frog's pelvis pivots on its spine like this. And it's just one of a bunch of folded up joints that make it possible for a frog, when it fires almost all the muscles in the back half of its body, to suddenly go from this little blob with a bump in its back to a really fast projectile that goes flinging through the air, okay? All frogs have all those modifications for jumping. That's the key innovation of frogs in the sense of what characterized the origin of those animals. Now we've got almost 6,000 species built on that original body plan, and they've in diversified incredibly. There are frogs that lay eggs on leaves out of water. There are frogs that give birth out of pouches on their back. There was an Australian frog until recently in which the female swallowed the eggs, her stomach shut down function, the stomach acted as a uterus, and she gave birth by vomiting out fully formed frogs. There is a Chilean frog, which should, this should make about half of us uncomfortable and half of us cheer. There is a Chilean frog in which the male ingests the fertilized eggs. They go into his vocal sacs, which are normally used for singing. They develop all the way to the full froglet stage in the male's pouch. So you have this phenomenon of a pregnant male, finally. And he gives birth by vomiting up these little froglets out of his vocal pouch. Frogs do amazing things. They, they get big, they get small, they walk, they crawl, they fly in some cases. Some of them swim really well. It's all imposed on this fundamental frogginess. Okay, so I hope you never look at a single frog the same way, now that you've learned these things about frogs. Let me just give you a notion of how diverse these are. And also sort of stress this notion that I imagine you've heard about, about tropical diversity. The whole state of California, which is a very big, diverse place, okay? California is a very latitudinally long place. It spans Oregon to Baja, California. It goes from below sea level in Guth Valley to Mount Whitney at 14 or 15,000 feet. All these different habitat zones and so forth. The whole state of California has about 15, arguably closer to 20 species of frogs. I could take you to a pond in the Cerrados of central Brazil where we might see 40 species of frogs in one night, okay? We could find three times or more species of frogs in one locality in Brazil as occur in the entire state of California. This is just a fraction of the frogs that, that were breeding in one pond in one night in central Brazil that I took pictures of. We've got a frog that makes a nest out of foam that it stirs up. It stirs up the eggs like meringue and makes a foam nest. Uh, we've got several different frogs here, those green frogs uh, in the upper right and in the lower middle. Those are frogs that meet in the water, clasp, and then before they lay eggs, go up into vegetation, lay the eggs on leaves, leave the nest up in the leaves. When the eggs hatch, the tadpole falls into the water and develops. On the lower right, you see a fairly typical toad, except it's about a foot long, and so on and so forth. I mean, phenomenally diverse. And if we were there with all these different frogs calling, I think you would have a mathematically sublime experience. You would be impressed by the sheer number of kinds of frogs beyond any impression you have of individual frogs, okay? Here's an extremely simplified phylogeny of frogs. 
And it even shows a close relative of frogs that preceded their origin called Triadobatrachus from the Jurassic about 245 million years ago. And what you see there is a branching diagram. So this is like a genealogy, but this is frogs. The living frogs are at the top, the past history of frog is as we go down through the branches. And I want you to notice that little brown frog on the upper left. That's called a tail frog, and it's one of only about three species in this lineage called the Lyopelmatidae. Tail frogs are found only in the Pacific Northwest of the United States and extreme southwestern Canada. They're rather nondescript looking, except the male has a little appendage that's called a tail and isn't, and it's actually used to transfer sperm to the female in the fast moving streams in which these frogs live. Now, like I said, it's a sort of a nondescript looking frog superficially. If you talk to a person who, who knows frog anatomy, they can start reeling out all these weird characteristics of the skull, the backbone, and so forth that show that it's an extremely primitive frog compared to most other living frogs. Remember, I said that there's this distinction between these on the one hand and all other frogs. In other words, there's about four species on the left-hand branch, and then there's 5,564 species on the other branch. My students in herpetology in Berkeley all knew about these frogs, and when we stood in the forest in Mendocino County with a live tailed frog in hand, I heard a student say, wow, this frog hasn't shared its genes with any other frog on Earth since the Jurassic. Okay? They're having a sublime aesthetic experience with this frog that goes beyond the fact that it's just a little brown frog. They realize they're holding a tremendous chunk of the legacy of this early evolution of this, this jumping machine that is all frogs. I want to say just a little bit before we move on to snakes about something I nicknamed at least magical sublimity. And this has a little bit to do also with um, sort of the joy of discovery in science. I'm going to show you pictures I took on two successive nights in the Pantanal, southwestern Brazil, near the Bolivian border, where I went with my wife and several other people that work on frogs, including some Brazilians. And we were really just sort of being ecotourists for a couple of nights and taking a break from our research work. The first night, I was walking around a pond with a woman named Cincha Prado, who'd studied this little frog for her PhD. This is a little frog that makes a meringue-like nest, and then after the male has fertilized the eggs, he lays, he leaves, but the female stays with the meringue nest till the eggs hatch, then she stays with the tadpoles till they develop all the way to the froglet stage. Okay? And the tadpoles uh, sit together in the pond in huge schools of several hundred individuals, the female sitting with them. And Cynthia had even seen that the female sometimes moves the school, but she, she never knew why. She and I were standing there in the dark in this pond. She said, oh, here's a Podicipinus over here, uh, uh, this frog, Leptodactylus Podicipinus, get your camera. So I went over to take pictures. While we were taking pictures of this female frog with her tadpoles, Cynthia says, ah, uma cobra, which means a snake in Portuguese. And we look, and here's this water snake, and it comes from the left and it starts eating the tadpoles. So we get all distracted, I grab the snake, we look in the snake's mouth, the mouth's full of tadpoles, we comment on that, we look back, the school has exploded, the school of tadpoles. Okay, so now that's, we estimate about 750 tadpoles that have just gone pow, like that over about a square meter area with the frog in the middle. And then over the next 20 minutes, she leaves the entire school 12 meters along the shoreline in the opposite direction from which the snake came. So, okay, so she led her tadpoles to safety. She did it by this very stereotype behavior of stopping, sticking her rear end up in the air, sort of pumping her hind legs like this. You can see the, the waves from her hind leg movements there in the water. The tadpoles would get strung out behind her. She would go faster than them and then she'd stop, somehow realizing they had strung out. She'd stop, make these pumping actions, all the tadpoles would catch up and then she'd go again. And over a 20 minute period, she moved them 12 meters along the shoreline. So we now know at least one reason why that female stays with the tadpoles and moves them around. The next night we saw something even more amazing. Uh, if you're used to mice, this might be an example of dynamic sublimity. These are the largest living rodents. There was a much larger related rodent, I think, right, Phil? I mean, that, the, 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 the extinct relative of capybaras was in the neighborhood of like hippo size or pygmy hippo size or something. It was an absolutely gigantic animal. But to someone who's never seen a capybara before, this is a pretty big rat, right? So we're driving down this little dirt road and there are these scattered breeding congresses of a different Leptodactylus frog. It's called Leptodactylus chakensis. It's about the size of your local leopard frog. We found three family groups of capybara sitting absolutely immobile next to these frog breeding choruses, surrounded by frogs. 
And in one case, there's actually a frog on the back of the capybara eating bugs. Okay? <laughs> These are cleaner frogs. These frogs are doing just like egrets do around cattle. Although when I tell that to an ornithologist, they get all snooty about it. Uh, it's like frogs can't be cleaners. Birds can, but not frogs. This is amazing. I've talked to people who work on cattle. Nobody's ever seen this before. There's a dissertation here. I mean, I don't know if you get this, this is, I tried to get out and get better pictures. So you can see the three frogs that were pointing at that big daddy capybara. I think that's a male and one of the kits. They're usually in a male, a female, and kits. In this one right here, I watched that frog sit on that back and hop around the back of that capybara. And in 60 seconds, it flipped its tongue three times at insects. Now, you might think, what, what good would it be if you're a capybara to have cleaner frogs? But, but you could calculate it, you know, three bugs a minute. 60 minutes, three cleaner frogs, four cleaner frogs. Now we're talking about five, six, seven hundred bugs an hour eaten by your cleaner frogs. Calculate the blood volume of those insects, divide it into the blood volume of a capybara, get some idea of the advantage of having a bunch of frogs around you. It really looked like a situation in which the capybara had, sat, had sought out the breeding aggregation of frogs, were sitting there very deliberately. The frogs were clearly deliberately around the capybara. And the part that just most astonished me is this one hopping around the capybara's back eating bugs. Okay, okay switch to snakes. This is sort of what got me thinking about all this in the first place, is trying to get people to care about snakes, especially dangerous snakes because I've mostly worked on, on rattlesnakes the last 25 years or so. Um, in the course of writing a book about snakes um, almost 15 years ago, I started reviewing the literature on sort of the natural history of snakes as well as the natural history of things that ate them and that they eat. And in the back of my mind was this question. It, it seems puzzling, not just that we dislike snakes so much, but that we on the one hand dislike them so much and on the other hand, in many cultures, actually deify them or like them for various reasons. I mean, why, why this polarization? Why not just hate them, you know? I mean, there are people who are so phobic of snakes that when this picture flashes up in the screen, they would have curled over like this and backed out the door, okay? And I appreciate that because that's how I feel about spiders, okay? On the other hand, there are people like me that since I was a little boy just love snakes, okay? So what's going on? And there are religions care about snakes and so forth. Well, what I, what I found when I reviewed the natural history literature is that every major lineage of primates includes species that are both eaten by snakes and eat and kill snakes, okay? So I think this is a very ancient part of our shared history. I think that whether or not the information is genetically transmitted or culturally transmitted or some interaction between those two possibilities, I think we have a very old, rich, and ambivalent relationship with snakes. I think that for the entire history of primates, which is, depending on estimates, somewhere around 65 to 80 million years old, and in any case younger than snakes, for the entire history of primates, we have both looked for them to eat because they're very easy to dispatch once you find them. There are even field observations of, of, of Cebus monkeys killing snakes with sticks, using a weapon to kill snakes. They're very easy to dispatch, they're good to eat, they're almost never noxious in terms of their flesh, so if you can kill one, you get a good meal. They're very puzzling, I mean, look at the way they move, not to mention other things about them. On the other hand, if you don't see the snake, you are susceptible to a very horrific, quick death, okay? because you either get squeezed by a constrictor or bitten by a venomous snake. Now, a missing sort of datum in all this, when I wrote my book, was what about people, though? I mean, it seemed like, yeah, we have a lot of information about snake bite to people, especially young, impetuous males that are handling them and teasing them. But, but what would it have been like for people living a sort of pre-industrial, even pre-agricultural lifestyle? What would be the relationship with snakes? And through a chance encounter, I met a man named Tom Hedlund, whose uh, wife, Janet Hedlund, took this picture on the left. These are Agta Negrita, Negritos on the island of Luzon in the Philippines in the late 1960s. So Tom did his PhD on sort of the linguistics of these people and other aspects of their culture. And in the course of that work, he spent a lot of time hunting with them. And he was out with these two men when they found this 25-foot uh, female reticulated python, dispatched her with a homemade shotgun, and then butchered her, gaining, we estimate, about 55 pounds of usable meat for their group. Um, in the course of his studies, Tom also surveyed 120 agta on a variety of issues, including had they ever been attacked by a wild animal. It turned out 26% of the adult males 
had, been, had survived predatory attacks by reticulated pythons. There were six fatalities from reticulated pythons within the collective memory of the group, including two while Tom was working with them. In the course of butchering reticulated pythons for food, the agta would discover in the stomachs from time to time monkeys, deer, and pigs, which the agta also hunted and ate. So the agta and reticulated pythons were simultaneously predators, prey, and potential ecological competitors. Is it hard to imagine that reticulated pythons were really thought-provoking aspects of their daily environment? I mean, I think when you look at it like that, it's not hard to imagine being absolutely terrified of snakes. I believe that she could have easily eaten those two guys. Look at her head compared to their heads. Active males weigh about 45 kilos or about 90 pounds. She weighed probably 150 to 200 pounds. I think if she'd got the drop on them, she could have eaten them both. And instead, they ate her. So that's the problem, okay? What can we do about it? Well, one of the things I've discovered in the case of the course of my work is that if you study animals as individuals and then can talk to people about, and, about animals as having individual lifestyles that are actually quite complex, if you can convince people that some potentially dangerous animal isn't actually out there just living to kill people, but actually would like to avoid people as much as possible and has a very interesting life, uh, that goes a long way. So I'm going to show you just a couple of uh, panels here from a 15-year field study I did on black-tail rattlesnakes in Arizona that's proved very useful in terms of educating people about the natural history of venomous snakes and, and I think in terms of engendering some appreciation for them. Um, I did this study in collaboration with a Tucson physician uh, David Hardy, who did it as a hobby. Uh, you'll see in a minute why it was useful to have a physician. The problem with snakes is that it's so difficult to find an individual once, let alone find the same individual over and over again. So when I was a, an undergraduate, I wanted to be like George Schaller. He was my hero. He's at the Bronx Zoo and he studies lions and gorillas and stuff. And I didn't want to study lions and gorillas, but I wanted to watch individuals. And I thought I'd never be able to do that with snakes. It turns out miniaturized radio telemetry has made that possible, and that's what we did in this study of 50 radio tracked rattlesnakes upon which we made almost 5,000 observations. This is a big, beautiful species. It's relatively easy to observe in the wild. A male's about, a big adult male's about push four feet long, a female's about three. Big male might weigh two pounds. Very inoffensive species. Uh, this is the transmitter implantation protocol. We buy the transmitters commercially. Each radio is about the size of a lipstick container. It has an antenna. It has a battery that lasts about two years. And once it's in the snake, you can find the snake from as much as about a half mile away using a portable receiver and antenna. Each radio has an individual frequency. So you just punch in the number of the snake you want to find, hold the antenna up, if this young lady right here is, is super female 21, the rattlesnake, I'm walking like this and I go beep, 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 beep. And then I start walking that way and I frequently point it at my feet and I don't want it to get louder when I do that. Okay? <laughs> because my goal is to, not, is to not disturb super female 21. I want to find her and then take pictures of her, make observations and so forth without disturbing her. So that's what we did. We observed individual snakes for up to 12 years. Um, I'll show you our record in just a minute, but I want to say one more thing about this panel. This picture right here is of a black tail rattlesnake that the photographer got too close to. So I almost never see rattlesnakes behaving like that. That's probably how you think of rattlesnakes. I almost never see them like that. And that's because I don't uh, traumatize them. So we're at pains when we catch them to do it very gently. We do all our procedures under anesthesia. We never mash down their heads and pick them up and show them off to the nearest uh, you know, somebody we can show off to. Uh, we don't talk about how dangerous they are or anything like that. We're, we're very nice to these animals. This is a rattlesnake that's afraid. Okay, this is a rattlesnake that's trying to tell you, you are making me extremely uncomfortable and I'm going to defend myself if you don't quit. One time we had an old rancher asked to go out with us. He's told, he bragged about the fact he killed every rattlesnake he'd ever seen his whole life. So we took him out to our study site, we dialed up male number nine, we turned the antenna. I said, hey Finn, there's the number nine out of that prickly pear cactus. And he goes, well, how come she's not trying to kill me? I said, well, you're not throwing rocks at her. So, uh, let me find female 21. So I found female 21 under a ledge. I said, there she is under that ledge. And he goes, how come she's not rattling and striking? I said, well, because you're not throwing rocks at her. You know, and it went on like that all morning. He, he had never seen a rattlesnake do anything but that. But of course, every snake he ever found had died. And that whole morning, he never saw a rattlesnake do that because we never got, let him get close and bother the animal. So here's the kind of things you can find out. A really dramatic thing about telemetry is it takes away your bias 
of where the animals are going to be. So I'd seen quite a few black-tailed rattlesnakes in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona before I started this study. And I have to say, a very small fraction of the snakes in our study were in the kinds of places where I was used to seeing black-tailed rattlesnakes. That's because in the past, I'd only seen black-tailed rattlesnakes where they were so easy to see that I, even I could see them, right? <laughs> Once you put a radio in them, they show up in places you're not expecting. The picture in the upper left is Super Female 21, my favorite snake of my whole life. And I took that photograph after I'd spent about 15 minutes trying to locate her under the base of a juniper tree. I did not know that these rattlesnakes climb trees. I kept getting a confusing signal. I got so frustrated, I took the antenna off the cable, got on my hands and knees. I thought she must be buried in the leaf litter. And I crawled around with the tip of the cable like this, trying to see where she might be located under the leaf litter. I finally set up. And actually, I remember I was thinking about Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, which is a book I read a long time ago, and it had this notion of a gumption trap where you're just being stupid and you can't get past something. So I was sitting there thinking, I am just stupid. You know, what am I doing wrong? And I tilted my head slightly to the left, and female 21 was sitting on a limb right next to my ear. And she never rattled, she never struck, she never even flicked her tongue. And I'm sure that one reason that snake did not get agitated is because I had never done anything to traumatize her. Well, we learned a lot of things about these animals. We watched their hunting behavior. It turns out they feed strictly on uh, things like the white-throated wood rat, the desert cottontail, and other mammals. We studied their social system. They have a really interesting, complex social behavior. The females aren't uh, ready to breed every year, whereas the males are. And so the males, during the brief breeding season, just drop everything and spend all their time looking for receptive females. They can distinguish the trails of receptive versus non-receptive females, and they ignore non-receptive females. And when they hit the trail of receptive female, they just become obsessed with finding her. When they find her, they spend hours, even days, courting her. Even after days of courting her, she may not or may allow them to mate and so forth. If another male comes along, they engage in these very stylized combat bouts in which they rise up in the air and try to press each other down. And usually, within a few minutes, the smaller male loses, leaves, and the bigger male goes back to courting the female. But the most exciting thing we learned is that these animals have parental care. At this point, which was in about 1990, that we first discovered this, nobody knew that rattlesnakes, let alone almost all pit vipers, had parental care. It was widely believed that like almost all reptiles, the female gives birth and takes off. So we were quite shocked. Well, let me back up and say the reason we discovered this is because the females are excessively shy when they're pregnant. They, they find a refuge, usually an abandoned rock squirrel burrow, and they just don't leave it. They come out to bask, but I mean, you, you'd be lucky to stumble upon a pregnant female. But because we have radios in them for years, we know when they mate, we know when they're going to be pregnant, and we start paying attention to them. So we would watch females all through pregnancy every day. And we come out there one day, and there she is, and there's the babies, and they're together. And what happens is for about the next 10 days, she basks with them every morning. If you get too close, the babies zip into the hole and the female backs in rattling after them. There's some variation among females. So some females always stay in the background and never come out of the hole while their babies are basking. We had one female that would come out of the hole and advance on you, which is extremely unusual for a black-tailed rattlesnake. So you some variation, but the female always stays with the babies for about 10 days while they go through this delicate pre-shed condition, and then she watches, as you can see in this photograph in the bottom, taken in the field. She, she watches her babies shed one by one, and within 24 hours of that picture, the babies have all dispersed. She's 40 yards away at a wood rat nest trying to get her first meal in almost a year, and the whole thing's over. Okay, so what do we do with this? Uh, in 1991, Natalie Angiers from the New York Times came to my lab in Berkeley to do a piece on pit vipers for the Science Times. And I had a, a really beautiful western rattlesnake that I used for lectures, and I had moved it into a plastic tube so that she could touch it. it this is the way we safely and gently immobilized venomous snakes. And so I had this rattlesnake tube, and Natalie was touching the skin. And, and uh, I started talking about this pipe dream I had, which was that someday ecotourists would actually sign up to go see timber rattlesnakes in the fall foliage of, of the northeastern US. And I thought of timber rattlesnakes because this is a snake that's uh, rich in the sort of iconography of American Revolutionary War history. There was a flag, a battle flag, with an icon of a timber rattlesnake that said, don't tread on me. Uh, Benjamin Franklin wrote an amazing essay about the timber rattlesnake as a symbol of freedom and liberty and independence. It's a little bit hyperbolic. He said things like, the rattle always has 13 segments, and if you break it apart, you can't make any noise, but put those 13 segments together, and they'll scare any man. You know, he went on and on and on about the timber rattlesnake. And yet, 
This snake at the time of the American Revolution was astonishingly abundant over the eastern half of the U.S., certainly one of the major top predators in its ecosystem, and today it's endangered in most states in which it lives solely because of human persecution, without justification. It's not a public health threat. Very few bites from this species. Actually, a very beautiful animal. And my vision was that you know people would want to go see this, and you'd do it in the fall when the leaves are out. You know, you could go to the den in the fall color. It'd just be a really marvelous thing for rattlesnakes. And Natalie wrote, "Ah, yes, get my travel agent. Like that'll be the day." So that was 1991. I lived in Berkeley. At 1999, I moved to Ithaca, New York. Uh, connect with a local, uh, a regional conservation group called the Finger Lakes Land Trust who's going to buy a piece of property because it has a timber rattlesnake den, one of the last two dens in my part of New York. And they have a program called Talks and Treks in which somebody gives a lecture on a Thursday night and then on a Saturday morning you take people that have signed up for this thing on a hike. So it might be about liverworts or ferns or spring wildflowers or migrant warblers or whatever. But the idea is you get the lecture on Thursday night where you learn about the stuff, and on Saturday you go see it. And so what you're seeing here is the first talks and treks, the first realization of my dream for ecosystem, I mean ecotourists to go out and look at rattlesnakes. So on a Thursday night, I gave them a lecture about timber rattlesnake natural history. I actually used information, Greg, that uh, my postdoc, Ruland Clark, got from examining timber rattlesnake stomach contents in the University of Michigan Museum of Zoology collections. And we taught them about timber rattlesnake biology. We had a live, um, sort of a mascot timber rattlesnake we used for demonstrations, and we set it out in a safe way so that people could see it's very easy to avoid the danger of this animal, and then, then you can start appreciating it. We took them on this hike. They loved it. We didn't even let them get close. We insisted they treat the animal respectfully. You know why those aren't bird watchers? Can you tell how the, you know why you can tell, look at this picture, these aren't bird watchers, you know? What do bird watchers do? They look up. It's amazing more bird watchers don't fall down. I mean, and it's very obvious why more bird watchers don't see snakes. These are not bird watchers. They're all looking at this pregnant female timber rattlesnake with her, uh, not, not pregnant, this female timber rattlesnake with her babies here that's in that rock pile. We marched them for four hours and we saw one snake, that one, okay? By the time we got them back to the parking lot, they were just bubbling. Can't wait to tell my husband I saw a rattlesnake. Did you see how pretty the scales are, like Dr. Green said? Can you imagine that eating a fox squirrel? That's what he said they eat, you know? Blah, blah, blah. They loved it, okay? And they loved it because they had been taught things about this animal. So I'm going to leave you with that. Uh, I think the thing I want to say in closing, though, is that for people like me and Bill and Phil and all us biologists, we sort of come through graduate school and grow up thinking that the main reason we do science besides the pleasure it gives us is that we're going to contribute to this body of knowledge and solve these big questions. And that's all true, but I think it could be that either the most or at least one of the most profound implications of what we do does not have to do with answering questions per se, but with giving people a broader contract text for appreciating nature. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be glad to answer questions. In India, cobras are caught in many areas and then put back and some of the cobras get used to this being caught and put back, mm -hmm. that they're not quite afraid of people in the same way. Mm -hmm. And there's also a cult of leaving among some Indians that they leave the coat, the, the snakes alone in certain areas, and if depending where it is. Now again, you didn't mention very much about mambas, mm -hmm. black mambas in other areas. And the anaconda, the largest snake of all. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> there are stories about that huge size that was called smaller people. Yet in many um, reports, there are very few instances of anacondas attacking people. Mm -hmm. But they will, the catipara and other animals go. And yet the anaconda itself may be killed by the um, jaguar. Mm -hmm. That's, That's all true. And I, I believe me, I would love to teach a whole course on snakes and, and spend a lecture each on cobras, anacondas, and black mambas. Well, I've never seen a black mamba in the field. I have. I have. Yeah. Too. That's about all. Yeah. Green mamba, too. Yeah. Yeah. Very large, dangerous snakes. But, uh, what is another interesting thing? Snakes don't go beyond the temperate climate. 
in the northern part of Europe. Right. And in my country, there are no stakes. Which is that? St. Patrick. Oh, Ireland, yeah. Uh-huh. Well, actually, uh, snakes go a little bit farther north than you might realize. There are European adders all the way to the Arctic Circle in, in Scandinavia, and they actually migrate across snow to get to their mating areas. There aren't very many snakes at, snakes at northern localities, but they do go to the Arctic Circle. And then there's one that goes, not to Tierra del Fuego, but it goes down to the peninsula of Valdez, very far south in Patagonia. The numbers drop off, though, as you get farther south. Yes, in Tierra del Fuego, are there any snakes? No, there are lizards, but no snake. None at all. Some of my work deals with the um, valuative relationships between the object and the whole. So uh, sublimity is as much a relationship between the contained and the container as it is necessarily a reaction to one or the other. And in the case of snakes, this may, I'm not sure where you're, you're intending to go with the theology or relationship of society to the snake, but in terms of deriving beauty from it, it's as much seeing the snake as a container for a certain um, viewpoint on the world or a certain sort of pattern. So you see it in the scales, but you also perceive the scales themselves. And obviously that intuition or, or intuitive relationship between the two uh, constitutes the beauty as much as anything. Kant is making that uh, distinction that is imperative versus the object from which you derive it. And so the snake as uh, quite literally an extended link between one point and another is um, a fairly in inherent um, re uh, reaction of the human to any sort of uh, natural object. Mm -hmm. um, so aesthetically, there's um, so much to be done here. It would be fascinating to develop that point. It would. I'd love to see you do that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean that sarcastically. I, I, I would love to see you do it. Uh, as, as long as my advisor allows it, I'm sure I okay. can yeah. fit something in. Yeah. Human relationships to snakes in places where there are many more venomous snakes than in North America? Yeah, I, I think, think that's, that's a, a really important question. And uh, I'm even going to generalize your question a little bit more. Um, I think that people ha in general have an incredibly hard time dealing with things that are dangerous to them. It is definitely the case that in parts of the world other than the United States, snakes are actually a huge public health problem. And I think that if you want to conserve something that's dangerous to people, you have to start by admitting it's dangerous and then solving that public health problem. So I can't quite imagine giving a talk like this in Senegal to a bunch of people who work agricultural fields barefooted or in parts of, like Java has a huge snake bite problem. There are places in Brazil where the snake bite problem is quite large. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dream of trying to convince people to try to tolerate snakes until I had substantially solved the problem of the snake's threat to them. And this is, I think, really a big deal. I, I am not convinced that, that we are willing to live with dangerous animals. That's why I feel, part of why I feel a little cynical about the prospects for tigers and polar bears, especially tigers. Um, and interestingly, it seems like a lot of conservationists or a lot of environmentally favorable people, especially in the United States, think that the way to do this is to essentially not admit these animals are dangerous. So I'm going to tell you a tiny anecdote. I gave a, so, a, a similar talk at the University of New Mexico a couple years ago. And since their mascot is the lobo or Mexican wolf, I wanted to close my talk with a Mexican wolf. I guess I should have used a wolverine tonight, shouldn't I? But I did use blue and yellow. Did you see that for my? <laughs> So I wanted a picture of a Mexican wolf, and I went to Google Images, and I typed in Mexican wolf, and I got about 30, and not one of them had a drop of blood in it. Not one of them had a dead ungulate in it. It was all these wolves that looked like my dog Riley, a Labrador retriever, in terms of its relationship to nature, you know. So I wrote to a friend of mine, Dave Foreman, who, who's involved in southwestern wolf conservation. I said, Dave, I need a picture. I want a spray of blood on this muzzle. I want uh, an elk rib cage in this picture. It's part of my purpose, it's, you know. And so he, he couldn't find a picture either. So he put out a note on a listserv for people who are trying to save Mexican wolves and, and gave my name and said I was looking for this. And I got deluged with all these emails saying I was crazy, that I was playing into the hands of the ranchers. Didn't I know what was up with trying to conserve this animal? I just don't agree with that position. I think the first place to start in having wolves back is to admit that they eat and kill things.
and then decide how much of that we can tolerate, what to be done about the intolerable parts, and so on and so forth. So sorry that was a long-winded answer, but I think your question's extremely interesting with regard to the sort of fate of dangerous animals on Earth. You started with how you can use a lot of the material in the museum to mm -hmm. learn about, a lot about, mm -hmm. you know, those things that in, are in jars. But it seems that a lot of your talk and about the sublime aesthetics, when you talk about context, you, you see that context as mainly being in nature. But do you also see a role for museums to do something with their jars that could provide people with that more contextual view of Right. Well, that, that's an interesting way to put it. Um, so I think the simple, easy answer is to say, I think by studying the California king snake in jars and then coming out with things that I can go use to talk to people about California king snakes or timber rattlesnakes or whatever, I, I'm basically using museums to go outward to people, right? But I think you're asking for more than that, aren't you? you and uh, <clears throat> One thing that interested me about that definition of museum is I, I, I imagine that no one museum would fit that entire definition. Maybe, maybe a few would, but the museums I've worked with tended to emphasize either research or exhibits or whatever, and maybe that's okay because each of these requires expertise. You know, public education is not the same expertise as studying snakes in the field and so forth. So um, I guess what I envision is that, uh, you know what I said about organismal biology being central, about organisms being central to biology even in all this technology? I think the two kinds of um, academic organizations or units that I, that I see as having the most potential for, for integrating science within itself and then integrating science outward to society are museums and field stations, okay? They seem like sort of the locus of the organisms themselves in terms of us studying them. So I, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to avoid your question. I'm probably not saying more because I'm not a museum person who's, who's actively involved in sort of taking it outward. You, you're welcome to tell me what you think I should do or what you think should be done. No, I mean, I invite you to. Can a zoo ever be sublime? Can a what? Zoo. A zoo? Yeah. You mean like a zoological garden? A zoological garden. Could you have a sublime experience in a zoological garden? Yeah, that's a pretty interesting question, isn't it? <laughs> like, meow. <laughs> Uh, I am personally defensive of zoos. I think that captive animals are ambassadors for the wild. I, I think we should try really hard to create environments in zoos that give animals a naturalistic lifestyle and a naturalistic context. I don't think that elephants should be in concrete paddocks with chains around their legs, and I think actually within a very few decades, you'll never see that in the zoo again, okay? But I also think, I'm try I have a hard time imagining how do I go to an inner city kid in New York, say in the Bronx, and telling him, I want you to be okay with tax dollars, resources, and so forth going to conserve the tiger, and I get to go see tigers because I'm relatively wealthy and I have an academic job, but you just get to see them in books. I can't get over that, okay? That's, that's the biggest single reason why I still think I'm okay with zoos. I, it's, it's not that I think the conditions for animals are always perfect in zoos or anything, but it, it's that I think those animals in zoos serve the cause of conservation. But I know it's a very controversial thing. Yeah. I have two grandsons in Brooklyn, so that's yeah. one of the reasons. So, so I, I do think you could have sublime experiences in zoos. You could, and you could probably have more of one if every, it, it, you probably have more of one when we push for sort of a naturalistic context, both for the animal and for the educational experience, right? Yeah. yeah. Tell, tell us about the origin of venom. Where does it start evolutionarily and so forth? The origin of what? Venom. Venom, oh boy. Well, that's actually quite controversial right now uh, in terms of specifics, but here's, th there are some things that we can be sure of. Um, Venoms are collection, cocktails of enzymes. They're derived from digestive enzymes. To some extent, some of the components are homologous, that is to say, based on shared descent from even pancreatic enzymes. The glands in a snake's head that produce the cocktails of venom are homologous with salivary glands, so that's what they're derived from. 
So that's the basic story, is that a venom delivery system in a snake consists of a tooth, some kind of conduction route, could be just a, a shallow pathway or a well-organized tube, and a gland that produces the toxin. So the whole thing is analogous to a hypodermic syringe full of some liquid. They're typically very complex, in some cases they're not. They often include both digestive properties and immobilizing properties. The two main groups of dangerously venomous snakes, cobras on the one hand, vipers on the other, tend to either concentrate on immobilizing toxins in the case of cobras, or enough immobilizing and a lot of digestive in the case of vipers. And the end result is both these two groups, the cobra family and the viper family, can eat, can subdue and digest bigger prey than any other snakes. So the biggest food item I've ever recorded for any snake in the world was about 160% of its mass. And that, those, I, found, I know of two or three like that, and they're always in vipers. So imagine me eating a 270 pound hamburger without benefit of silverware and without using hands <laughs> and, and swallowing it whole. That's what, and then, then, then only having to do that about four times a year. That's, that's, the, that's the lifestyle of a viper. It's amazing, it's an incredible thing. You want to know how they do it real quick? Yeah. This is really cool, because you can teach even little kids about this. I've had a whole preschool class doing this. So the thing you want to remember is they do not unhinge their jaws, okay? That's not true. I'm just amazed that even trained biologists talk about snakes and they don't unhinge their jaws. So here's the key, two key things. It's fairly complicated, but there are two key things. And once I explain this, I'm going to show you how to make a model with your own body that you can illustrate this with. And it, next time you see on Animal Planet, or if you have a pet snake, or you know somebody, next time you watch it eat, you'll see what I'm describing. The first thing is that most vertebrates, especially terrestrial vertebrates, during development fuse two halves of the lower jaw at a joint right here called the mandibular symphysis. And you can feel it if you put your finger up to your chin. You'll feel a little groove between two bumps. If you're old enough to remember Kirk Douglas, he had a very obvious mandibular symphysis, okay? So in snakes, that joint never forms. And that means the two halves of the lower jaw can be independent like that. The second thing is, most vertebrates suspend the lower jaw from the skull with a joint. And if you ever have this uh, condition called bruxism, where you grind your teeth in your sleep and you wake up with a pain in your ear, you go to your dentist, they'll start talking about your TMJ problems, your temporomandibular joint problem. And if you put your finger here, that's your temporomandibular joint, okay? And that, that gets very sore if you grind your teeth in your sleep. In, sna in snakes, the lower jaw, jaw doesn't articulate with the skull there. There's one or two strut-like bones hanging down that themselves movably articulate with the skull, and the lower jaws are suspended from them, okay? So here's how you can model that with your own body. If you put your hands like this, <coughs> now pretend you're a lizard head, and you open your jaws like this, okay? This is your mandibular symphysis, your clasped hands. Your upper arms are, are the, the, the potentially free-swinging quadrate bones that are built into your skull because you're a lizard. And you open your jaws like this, and the biggest food item you can swallow has to go through this triangular hole right here, okay? But if you're a snake of the same head length with no mandibular symphysis and free-swinging quadrate bones, you can swallow something that'll go through a hole this big. And what a snake does is not to pull the food item into its mouth. We used to say that, and then finally we thought, that's impossible. That little head can't move a rabbit. It, but then we thought, it doesn't have to. All it has to do is move itself. And so what happens, you can see this in films, the rabbit, the rabbit or whatever is being eaten just sits there, and the snake goes like this and walks its head over the rabbit. That's how it happens. A little more complicated, but that's the nuts and bolts of it. And you can explain this to little kids, and it's really funny to have about 20 preschoolers all going like this. <laughs> So, yes? What's your favorite species of snake, and have you ever been bitten? Okay. She asked, what's my favorite species of snake, and have I ever been bitten? And uh, I will answer in reverse order. So, I, I was bitten by the third venomous snake I picked up. It was a copperhead. I was 17 years old. It was not a very serious bite. I actually concealed it from my parents for, for years. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, I basically learned my lesson. Uh, when they do studies of snake bite epidemiology, they distinguish between legitimate bites and illegitimate bites. A legitimate bite is one that, an illegitimate bite is one that happens because you purposely interacted with a snake. And that's, oh yeah. And, uh, and so, 
illegitimate fights in the United States primarily happen to males between the age of 16 and 24, <laughs> often when they've been drinking. And it's, we, male, we, well, never mind, I was gonna, we go through this thing called testosterone tyranny, which is a terrible, terrible thing that men have to go through, and, and that's why we get bitten by venomous snakes. My favorite snake is actually that species I studied in Arizona, the black-tailed rattlesnake. I think it's a absolutely wonderful animal. It's a, it's a beautiful creature. Uh, I learned a lot from it. And that, for, that stuff. I just wanted to follow up on the, the conserve. In order to conserve, you need to love. And I'm, and I'm with you there myself. I can go with the issue of, oh, and by understanding and being fascinated and mm -hmm. having the wonder of observing, you can get that love and you get that wonder and you conserve. But what about um, those people in society that access uh, and a, a sentiment for conservation that may not be science based? That may, I mean, what can museums do to um, maybe kind of mythologize animals in a new way to uh, kind of create that love that would allow them to conserve? I mean, I, I'm just wondering if there's another way to access the people that aren't so science-based for finding mm -hmm. that love. For love. Yeah, love of the animals, therefore, to conserve. Because, I mean, it's, it's got to be driven by that. It's, mm -hmm. you know, rather than kind of, oh, this will, we can figure out some medicinal uses of this plant or this... Uh, or this frog or whatever. We can look at it scientifically like that. Mm -hmm. Or we can argue for some kind of humanistic drive behind it. And I'm just wondering what parts museums might be able to play in just kind of creating that new place of wonder for those people that aren't scientifically trained. Mm -hmm. When you work with your preschoolers, do you like uh, kind of present other kinds of ways of appreciating uh, that that sense of love so that conserve, conservative values can be instilled in them, other than just, look at this. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think of, look at another part of population that might access a conservative ethic yeah. different from this, different from this. Because not everyone's gonna maybe... Um, right. Kind of ah, overwhelmed with these, with these stories and they might want to appreciate them in a different way. So I've never thought about this in terms of museums. I'm not sure quite what to say back to you, except the easy thing was, what do you think? But, uh, well, I, I, I don't, I'm just kind of like thinking, kind of creating a, kind so, of culture, a new way of appreciating animals that maybe yeah. are not based just in science. And I'm, I'm, I'm with you with this. This I go with this myself. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people that, that I end up teaching and stuff, I have to kind of touch them in a different way. Yeah. So. You know, uh, in this little conversation we're having, the word science means sort of facts about, right? And so, what strikes me is that when I go see little kids, you can't give them very much in the way of facts, because they're not, I mean really little kids, they're not ready for it. So you can give them simple facts. You can show them that it's okay to be around the animal, and of course I don't take dangerous animals around them. So you can let them exercise their own curiosity, and that certainly is what ends up happening. They, I have a six and a half foot black pine snake I take to classes, and she's like this big around in velvet black, and I have pictures of little kids all over the floor with her, you know, and so they, their curiosity gets exercised. Then I'm also thinking about your question, I mean, if you ask why are people, why do people care about nature, and why are people willing to sacrifice for nature or be taxed for nature or whatever, the, the reasons, seem to fall into just a few categories, you know, and uh, one of them is utilitarian economic considerations, and so people are, I mean, it's, it's all dicey, look, I mean, we have trouble shutting down fisheries as the fisheries blip out of existence. I mean, telling people that, that if they keep fishing like this, there won't be any fish to catch in five years, and that doesn't, touch. And that doesn't seem to get work. Uh, you can tell, we can tell people that, I mean, there have been compounds found in frog skin that have incredible medicinal properties. They, there are things in poison dart frog skin that seem to mimic morphine, I think, without having adaptive properties. I might have the exact story a little slushy, but that's the basic idea. So obviously we can gain medical benefits from nature, but those are all sort of economic human health. And I think it's quite arguable whether that's gonna do enough good. Then, then you can go at it from the sort of value point of view people's values, and that seems to merge more into this kind of thinking, you know, appreciating, caring for, not being afraid of. But beyond that, I'm sorry, I don't have a, I don't know what to say next about the museum thing. Maybe you can, do you have an answer? Uh, no, but. <laughs>
I appreciate your question. Yeah. Perhaps related to this, um, and Bill mentioned that you were working on something with art in nature or art in field station stuff. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on that? And it seems yeah. potentially related. Well, it, it is. So, so I'm writing a book, another book. It's called Tracks and Shadows Field Biology as Art. And so I, I thought of the title about 30 years ago, and I wasn't ready to write the book. So I literally made a folder and set it aside and kept doing my thing and became middle-aged and wrote a book. And now I'm like, I hope I can still say late middle age. You know, I'm thinking about, I'm ready to write this other book. And this book is partly a memoir. It's, it's partly about, um, about being a geeky little snake kid. It's about being an ambulance driver and an army medic. It's about being attracted to violence and not quite knowing why after doing all those things. It's about being attracted to venomous snakes for a long time and studying venomous snakes and why that, you know, and then kind of figuring it out. It's also about um, why we care about nature. So part of the book is about the meaning, meaning of words like wild, wilderness, nature, natural, and so forth. It's especially about predators. And it's also about aesthetics and especially about art. And I, I claim that doing what I do, which is go out in the field and study nature, watch it, write down what I see, and then interpret it, for myself and others is almost exactly equivalent to being an artist. And uh, when I first told some artist friends of mine about this title, they actually sort of scoffed at it and they didn't like me appropriating that word art like that. Whereas I, when I say this title to fellow biologists, they almost always sort of nod their head appreciatively. They, it's like they just get it, you know? Well, then I found out that actually, if you go back to some of the earliest known art, which is uh, cave art from more than 30,000 years ago, some of, the, some of the rock art, the really real, old rock art, is sort of what we're, we're used to seeing, sort of surrealistic, icon, iconographic, sort of, you know, it's stylized. But some of it is precisely beautiful, realistic drawings of things like courtship behavior and lions. I mean, they've taken people, they've taken a guy, Craig Packer, into this cave. He's an expert on that lion behavior and showed him these drawings. And he's like, oh, yeah, look, the male is crouched down lower than the female because he's trying not to threaten her, you know, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, whoever made these drawings, they're 35,000 years old, was quite obviously trying to precisely recreate something they'd observed in nature. So I would maintain in that instance, art and natural history were in fact the same, the literally same activity. Does that make any sense? So that, that's what I'm trying to do in this book, is sort of work through what it means to do natural history, both in terms of the importance of natural history to society in the outer world, but also in terms of what the doer gets out of it. So it may not, I hope I'll make, I hope to make sense of it by the time I finish the book, so. So let's thank Harry for a really great talk. Thanks. Appreciate you.